Uh, we are glad to have with us today Hoover National Security Affairs Fellow, Lieutenant Commander Manuel Hernandez, joining us today for a discussion about the U.S. Naval strategy, as well as the research that he is currently doing here at the Hoover Institution. Lieutenant Commander Manuel Hernandez is a uh, surface warfare officer uh, who has served extensively on destroyers and warships on, in the Pacific Fleet. He is also, uh, when he's not off offshore, he has also worked as a naval liaison to the United States Congress for, on strategy. And he is, also, um, he, ha he is also an advisor to the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations on strategy and long-term planning. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Lieutenant Commander Manuel Hernandez. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. I don't think I'll, I'll need the microphone. I'm already. Uh, I first wanted to, to thank uh, Julie and Sarah for the invitation uh, to, to do events like this, outreach efforts. Um, as a National Security First Fellows here at Hoover, uh, this is uh, really one of the great pleasures that, uh, that we have the opportunity to do. In fact, we uh, see it as almost a responsibility to be able to do these outreach educational efforts to, in my case, to just uh, tell you a little bit about the Navy uh, and what we are doing and why we are doing these, uh, what, we, what we do on a daily basis. So what I'd like to do today is, uh, it, um, in order to kind of set the stage, I'd like to show just a quick video of our maritime strategy. It's a short video, two minute video. Uh, and then I'm gonna follow it up with about three or four slides. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in the military culture to use PowerPoint and you know, as I'm, as I'm trying to, to, uh, to get away from PowerPoint, it's, uh, it's just too, trong, too strong of an attraction. So I, I limit it to, to three or four slides, but I think it'll set a good stage uh, for the, for the Q&A session. And, then, uh, and once I'm done with the slides, I'll sit down and I'll talk very briefly about what I am doing here with respect to my research project on, uh, on uh, Navy energy and, uh, and alternative energies, biofuels specifically. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and show the video and uh So again, uh, it, you know, as the video uh, I think quite clearly uh, shows that even in this age of instantaneous uh, communications, uh, international travel, what happens in the ocean still matters to global uh, peace and prosperity. Uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about the challenges that we face in the maritime domain, but we certainly face significant challenges. Your U.S. Navy uh, is providing that stability that's necessary, that's, that security that is uh, necessary for all nations, no matter how landlocked uh, you are as a nation, global peace and prosperity and, uh, and stability in the maritime domain matters. The, uh, in 2007, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral Gary Ruffhead, 
along with his counterpart, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, rolled out uh, what uh, is, is our cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. Uh, and this is our enduring maritime strategy, again, signed by the three uh, leaders of uh, you know, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and uh, the Coast Guard. Uh, there's three points that I want you to, to take away from this. Uh, they really define what we do as a strategy uh, in, in the Navy. Uh, the first one is this, is that we give equal weight not only at preventing war, uh, but also winning wars. So to us, it's just as important, uh, you know, deterring war than it is uh, to winning wars. If necessary, we'll certainly go kinetic, and we'll certainly, uh, you know, do the nation's business uh, if, if the commander-in-chief so much uh, uh, calls us into doing that. But it's important for us to, de to deter uh, major power of war, to maintain the peace and, and stability that is necessary that I talked about in the initial slide. The second one uh, is a recognition that uh, today's problems, not only in the maritime domain, but in all domains, uh, are beyond uh, any one nation to handle effectively. And because of that truth, uh, we embrace the power of partnerships, cooperatives, on an international scale. We work with uh, you know, nations throughout the world, again, to ensure the security, the stability of, in my case, uh, the, the, uh, the global commons, the seas. Uh, and the third uh, point that I want you to get out of this is that uh, our maritime strategy uh, elevates humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, along with maritime security as a core capability slash competency of what we do as the United States Navy. Uh, that, of course, goes along with our enduring capabilities of forward presence, deterrence, sea control, and power projection. Your Navy today, your Navy right now uh, is comprised of over 600,000 men and women, over half of which are in uniform on active duty, uh, either uh, officers enlisted and midshipmen. On any given day, excuse me, on any given day, roughly 20% of your men and women are uh, either underway or deployed uh, overseas, executing the tenets of the maritime strategy. Almost 50% of the ships, carriers, destroyers, submarines, auxiliary ships, are operating, again, on an international scale, on a global scale. Today, Again, your, na your, your, men and, your men and women in uniform in the United States Navy are executing these, these, these pillars, these core capabilities of your U.S. Navy. Where are we? The John C. Stennis Carrier Strike Group is, is, is uh, uh, readying itself to go uh, deploy to the Middle East, uh, perhaps deploy to the Seventh Fleet uh, area of operations. They're actually conducting training off the, uh, the western coast of the United States. Southern Partnership Station is a global maritime partnership uh, mission that we do in order to increase the, the capacity of uh, Latin American countries, uh, primarily for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, but certainly for medical uh, purposes as well, carrying uh, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, State Department officials. So, you know, as a, as a, um, in a synchronized fashion, uh, Southern Partnership Station is being executed today. Uh, in the 5th Fleet AOR, which is Central Command Area of Operations, you see this heavy emphasis. Uh, we have the Abe Lincoln Carrier Strike Group. Uh, you have the Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group and the Macon Island Amphibious Ready uh, Readiness Group, all conducting, uh, uh, you know, forward presence uh, operations, maritime security operations, ensuring, uh, you probably heard in the news uh, recently what's going on in the Straits of Hormuz, the tensions that are going on uh, uh, with Iran, um, certainly the piracy off the coast of, uh, of the Gulf of Aden is a continuing concern. Uh, we're doing kind of piracy operations with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, over, certainly over 10, uh, over 10 nations as, again, a cooperative in order to, uh, to finally uh, uh, 
you know, counter this problem of, kind of, of piracy. The Seventh Fleet uh, Area of Operations in the Western Pacific. Uh, as you know, the uh, Defense Strategic Guidance uh, uh, communicated our Pacific pivot to the Western Pacific. Uh, our, our emphasis now on the Western Pacific with a continual emphasis on the Middle East. We have the Bahan Richard Amphibious Ready, uh, Readiness Group, George Washington Bat uh, Battle Group, and the Essex Amphibious Ready, uh, Readiness Group. Uh, the Straits of Malacca, a strategic choke point that, that, uh, that is in our interest to ensure the, the free flow of, uh, of trading goods, uh, not only for our nation, but for, for the entire globe. So this is, again, what your men and women today uh, are currently operating in, are currently doing. And we do this, again, in a cooperative nature. If you notice uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan, the flags representing uh, the coalition countries that are operating under ISAF, uh, again, a significant uh, international effort in Afghanistan. Uh, reinforcing the tenets of our maritime strategy. One of the items that I wanted to point out here was the, uh, was the, the, the number of sailors, over 10,000 sailors that we currently have on the ground in Afghanistan, contributing to the operations of ISAF, contributing to the stability of Afghanistan, winning uh, the hearts and minds anywhere from, uh, from uh, uh, medical personnel to construction personnel, security personnel, so we have over 10,000 uh, sailors on the ground currently in Afghanistan. Most people just think that you know sailors obviously at sea, but uh, but your men and women uh, in in uniform in the uh, in the United States Navy are indeed serving and supporting operations in Afghanistan. There are significant challenges that we're currently facing, not only as a navy but as a nation. Our fiscal uh, environment is certainly putting significant pressure and, 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 and begging the question, you know, what can we uh, sustain? What is important for uh, our country? Uh, the Commander-in-Chief uh, certainly has come out and said, look, our emphasis on the Western Pacific, continual emphasis on the Middle East, we'll continue to maintain uh, a presence in, uh, in Latin America and the Western Hemisphere. There are significant challenges. Uh, I will tell you that the United States Navy is well positioned to respond to the demands that the Commander-in-Chief has laid out. We are, by nature, a forward deployed force. We are over the horizon operating on a global scale, and we do this as a cooperative, uh, you know, in, in concert with our, uh, our partners. Uh, you know, we are executing the, the enduring uh, imperatives uh, of, the, of our uh, maritime strategy, again, with an emphasis today on the Western Pacific. Our ground forces are resetting. Uh, the troops are coming back from Afghanistan. They've come back from Iraq. But as those troops come back, those ground forces, uh, the naval forces will continue to operate forward. Uh, so we certainly have significant challenges. I want to provide that as a context. Uh, can you get the slides? Uh, the lights, and, uh, and I'll open it up for, uh, for questions, uh, not only here, but, uh, but in the uh, further, uh, the blogosphere there. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. <clears throat> As we open it up to questions, please make sure that when you do ask questions, speak into this microphone. We'll pass this along. Um, So um, in, in policing the global commons, which I think is a great metaphor for talking about the world's oceans, right? Correct. I mean, here's something that belongs to everybody, but not everybody has the capacity to help police it. Uh, in sharing that burden, what percentage is the United States shouldering, do you think? Uh, well, I appreciate the question. Um, Let me, let me mention this. Uh, the, the, from a percentage standpoint, uh, I, I can't really answer the question in general. What I will tell you is that if you give me some context, then I can certainly answer it. Let me give you an example. 
Uh, I mentioned the Global Maritime Partnership uh, missions that we're doing uh, around the globe, Pacific Partnership in, uh, in, in the Western Pacific with Pacific nations. Uh, we're doing a Southern Partnership Station. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, medical uh, operations. Uh, and, and we're doing this in concert with the nations in, the, in those areas. I would say that for those missions where it's, it's certainly, uh, if not equal, a greater burden or, or, or cost sharing, if you will, from, from, the, from the other nations beyond just the United States Navy. Now, there are certainly some operations that we're doing that are more on the kinetic side, that are more on the high end of warfare, where we are certainly uh, uh, shouldering more of the load. Uh, Anti-axis area denial strategies that some countries are employing today uh, is an example of that, both in the Western Pacific and the Middle East. The Middle East, as I mentioned uh, today, the emphasis, not only today, but in the past uh, month or so, Iran threatening to close the Strait to Hormuz is a significant concern. 20% of our energy needs are being transported you know, from the Strait to Hormuz. That's just our uh, uh, interest, uh, not to mention the, the, the global trade that passes through those Straits of Hormuz. That is a significant interest that we, as the United States Navy, uh, are heavily uh, uh, focused on. There are certainly other countries that have uh, interest there, but uh, this is not uh, an issue about percentages. This is an issue of ensuring the stability and, uh, you know, of the global commons. Uh, yes, uh, you know the the issue is going to be it's going to become a little bit more pronounced. You know when the fiscal because of the fiscal environment. Uh, you know and I echo what Secretary of Defense uh, Gates uh, said before he left office, that uh, the global community has to take their their fair share of the burn. It can't not just be the United States Navy or the Army or the Marine Corps. All the other nations have uh, an interest in ensuring, in, in, in my line of business, the global commons to maintain that stability and that security necessary for the global you know, complex marketplace, the free flow of, 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 uh, of goods that, uh, that we uh, you know, enjoy on a daily basis. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, the civilian side of things are the civil servants, uh, and the reservists, of course, are are, are um, men and women that are certainly uh, civilians, but then get activated into an active status, if you will, to support X operation. For example, Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, you know, people that you know are firefighters in the civilian sector, are doctors in the civilian sector, uh, get recalled. Uh, into uh, an active status to support operations in, you know, Afghanistan, certainly in Iraq, uh, where you know our need for forces, you know, has has increased. But civil servants are strictly civilians supporting uh, the U.S. military. They're not in a or they're not on active on active status or potentially have or have the potential to be serving on active uh, uh, duty. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you for talking to us today. You talked a little bit about green energy. Can you elaborate on the Navy's short-term and longer-term plans sure. for dealing with green energy and oil issues as they come up? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, um, my, my, Studies here uh, as, a, as a fellow deal with alternative energies. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, being the largest user of uh, fossil fuels or conventional fuels in the, in the U.S. government, we certainly have an imperative to, to lessen not only our demand, uh, but also where we, where we uh, uh, get that fuel from. Uh, the U.S. Navy has really taken the lead on uh, alternative energies. The Secretary of the Navy, uh, Mabus, uh, two years ago laid out some rather ambitious goals, five 
very ambitious goals. I'll talk about two of them. One of them, the, 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 the broadest one, is that by 2020, 50% of our energy use will come from alternatives. Uh, which brings me to my, the, the, uh, you know, the other goal, uh, which is where my research lies, is on biofuels. Uh, in 2016, we will be sailing the great green fleet akin to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, great white fleet, entirely on biofuels. Uh, how great and how green is still to be determined. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but biofuels is certainly something that we are interested in uh, for a lot of reasons. There are strategic interests, there's tactical interest. I'll talk about, uh, I'll give you an example of, of each. On the strategic side, most of the fuel that we get comes from places that are extremely uh, unstable. You see the effects of, of the global uh, uh, gas prices today with just the threat of the Straits of Hormuz being uh, in some way blocked. So we have a strategic interest. On the tactical side, let me give you a number that I think is staggering. Uh, our logistical needs in Afghanistan are significant and remain significant. For every 50 convoys of gasoline that we transport into Afghanistan, a Marine either loses his life or gets wounded. So, so it, it, that's just entirely too much. So we have a tactical imperative and a strategic imperative to not only lessen our demand, but also come up with alternatives that perhaps you know, will certainly help uh, you know, on the demand side. We're working on a supply side on biofuels. Uh, my research, uh, and this is a question, uh, Lisa, that I think pertains to, to what you're saying, uh, your question on, uh, on uh, the burden, the cost sharing, if you will, from our international partners. Uh, one of the problems that we have with biofuels right now is that it's not at scale. How do we bring a market uh, that is economically competitive with fossil fuels that can eventually replace uh, you know, fossil fuels? Uh, we can only do that if it's com is economically competitive, and it's not there yet. Uh, technologically speaking, it's also not there. Uh, our, our current strategy, um, uh, as, as promulgated by, by the President of the United States, is to uh, the President of the United States uh, ordered the United States Navy to grow a commercial market. So the United States Navy in concert with the Department of Energy and the Department of Agriculture are doing this. They've infused subsidies into this biofuel market in order to scale it uh, domestically. So the strategy is really uh, focused on the domestic marketplace for a lot of reasons. My argument, and this is Manny now, um, <laughs> my argument is that I think we, we, we should employ the expertise of the international community. Not only the expertise, but the resources of the international community. We're not the only nation that has an interest in diversifying our energy needs. We're not the only nation that has uh, an imperative, a strategic imperative, a, or a, a, and a tactical imperative. We're not the only nation that has this interest. Look at the, you know, I point to you just the major strategic choke points. It's the Straits of Malacca, uh, where a lot of the, the Western Pacific nations uh, depend on almost entirely for, for trade, for energy. All those nations there have an interest in ensuring that we diversify our needs, if not, uh, uh, certainly to maintain the security of those straits, but diversifying our needs, if we're talking about alternative fuels. Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, China, uh, that's just the Western Pacific. Uh, in the, in the, the Western Hemisphere, Brazil has been a, gr a leader in ethanol uh, um, you know, uh, um, use. Uh, now, ethanol obviously comes with a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of issues, but the point is that the technology is there. 
And I think that we can scale, uh, we can grow a competitive, uh, a, a economically competitive market of alternatives uh, if we work uh, on an international scale with all of our friends and allies and partners. Uh, and, and, and again, it's just another opportunity for us to cooperate on a global scale on something that is uh, a con of concern to, to many nations. That's my, uh, that's my, uh, my research. Uh, hope to have it completed here in about, uh, uh, about three months. Um, but that is, that is essentially what I'm concentrating on. I'll, uh, I'll mention just one other point. Uh, this is not just uh, biofuels. This is the, the installations. As you know, the U.S. military has uh, an, an immense amount of installations globally. So distributed energy, smart meters. Uh, you know, how do we take advantage of that technology? And it's also on the educational side, on the efficiency side. Uh, the Navy Postgraduate School uh, is, is uh, the Secretary uh, of the Navy just, uh, just announced uh, some months ago uh, that uh, we're doing a master's degree program in, in, at the Navy Postgraduate School on energy, which again, uh, you know, helps build the awareness of, of, uh, of energy uh, and, and the technology necessary in order to get us to where we want to be. Uh, we have certified every one of our aircrafts, uh, the F, uh, F-18s, uh, you know, with, with biofuels, the Blue Angels, uh, are now flying on biofuel blends. Um, we are uh, the uh, the name escapes me right now, but it's the uh, the Green Hornet is is what we called it. Uh, but we are we have made significant prog uh, progress. There's still a lot to be uh, uh, you know a lot to be done, but uh, but the emphasis I think is the correct one. Uh, the strategy uh, I, I absolutely uh, support. Um, uh, I hope that my research in some way can contribute to, you know, to this, this trajectory that we're headed to. Um, going a, a little bit back to the sort of strategic uh, questions, I, I've read that uh, the budget cuts that the military might be looking at could lead to a, a rethinking of the notion of sort of having a, a two-ocean navy. And I don't know if that's maybe too simplistic a, a sort of term to be using, but I just wondered if you could sort of speak on what uh, the what possible budget cuts could mean for defense of the United States and what it could mean for our naval forces, and if that sort of two ocean versus one ocean navy is actually an accurate way to be thinking about it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the question. Uh, it's certainly uh, in everybody's minds uh, today. Uh, you know, what the actual budget implications um, uh, will be on defense. Uh, I, I will tell you that I think uh, um, your mentioning of the one ocean or two ocean Navy, uh, I think what, uh, what, what you may have been reading uh, was the emphasis on our old defense strategy where we should be, the military is, is required to handle two simultaneous conflicts uh, on, on any two uh, fronts, not necessarily two, a, two, a, you know, a one front Navy or a two front Navy. We need to be able to handle two simultaneous conflicts, at the, at wars, if you will, at any one time. That is no longer the case. The, uh, the defense strategy that was just unveiled by uh, the commander in chief uh, says that uh, we are certainly, we certainly need to be ready to control one, uh, one war and, and very quickly scale up to support another one, which implies a, a um, uh, not as a, um, um, it's not like the old strategy where we had to actually uh, take on two wars simultaneously. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not in reference to the Navy. The Navy will continue to remain you know, a global uh, force, uh, forward deployed. Uh, on a global scale, again, with our, uh, with our friends. What does it mean to the U.S. Navy? Uh, the U.S. Navy for, for, uh, for a long time has had to go up through a 313 ship Navy. Right now we're at 283. 
uh, and, and in the near future, uh, the way that plants are made up, and because of the funding uh, issues that you just mentioned, uh, we're not going to get there. Uh, we, we are still uh, uh, going to remain in the Middle East. There's still going to be a presence in the Middle East. We, get, we have now a, a, um, a greater emphasis on the Western Pacific. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Panetta, just announced uh, two months ago that we are retaining our 11 carrier force. So the carrier force is not going to be reduced. Um, it's, it, it certainly uh, means that our ground forces will be reduced. The Army will go down, if I'm not mistaken, it's 80,000 troop reduction. Uh, the, uh, the Marine Corps is, is going to go down slightly, not as much, of course. Our special forces will remain uh, uh, as they are today, if not grow um, somewhat. Uh, here is a significant problem, though, that, that I think... Um, um, that I think you should be aware of, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive you are, but for the sake of, of the greater uh, community here, is the issue of sequestration. Uh, the, 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 the Defense Department was, um, because of the Budget Control Act, uh, we were required to reduce our um, uh, expenditures by uh, a little over $500 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, our current budget proposal does that. It reduces our expenses by $500 billion over the next 10 years, eventually. The issue of sequestration, though, uh, uh, essentially says this, that we, st we may need to cut an additional $500 billion, which I will tell you will be catastrophic to what we do in the U.S. military and what the nation calls us to do. If you don't have the funds, something will give. The structure that we currently enjoy today, it's not going to be there. So if you need, you know, as a slide that I showed that you have a carrier presence of two, you know, two or three carriers in the, in the Western Pacific or, or in, the, uh, uh, in the Middle East, uh, some tough decisions, strategic decisions will, ha will, will, will have to be made uh, because you cannot operate a U.S. military uh, today's military with that um, requirement of reducing an additional $500 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but I will tell you, there, there is significant, uh, there's significant dialogue going on uh, today as we speak about you know, what is more important. What are our global priorities? What are our global interests? Um, our footprint, for example, on the Western Pacific uh, it's not going to be as pronounced as perhaps it was, you know, a year uh, ago. Uh, you know, we, we're going to scale up in the Western Pacific. Uh, yes, our troops will be coming down from Afghanistan. Uh, you know, um, but but it's it's a significant concern. It really, really is the budget, the fiscal environment, and it's not just the U.S. military. Uh, you know, USAID on the development side, State Department on the diplomacy side are also feeling the effects. Uh, so, you know, as a nation, I think the conversation is, uh, or rather the question is, what is it that you expect from your development, from your diplomacy, and from your security uh, establishments? And what are you willing to give up? I think that's the question. 